book, the Quran, was revealed, given to him, is the last of the prophets, the seal of the prophets, God's messenger, God's servant and his messenger. <clears throat> he is our example for good behavior and for good character and for productive work that Allah created every human being for. Hence God says, any uh, Muhammad is a model, is an excellent model for any who believes in God and believes in being accountable to God. This is uh, what uh, God says to us in our holy book, the Quran. So Muhammad is not just a model for Muslims, he's a model for human beings, for all people, a model for any who believes in God and believes in being accountable to God. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Allah, God says of him again, so that we know he's for all people, God says, Muhammad is a mercy to all mankind. Rahmatan lil nas wa rahmatan lil alameen. Mercy to all the worlds. <clears throat> this is Muhammad. So we cannot make this religion small. It's not small. Uh, Maulana Maududi, uh, perhaps the most popular of the recent reformers, uh, scholars who reform, who bring Muslims back from deviations, uh, who bring Muslims back from a dull life to uh, have enthusiasm and drive, uh, reformer. Uh, Maulana Maududi said on Mount Arafat, uh, some years back, I happened to be there myself, long time ago, <laughs> must have been 40 years ago, and uh, Maulana Maududi learned that the son of Elijah Muhammad was making a hajj, and uh, it was on Mount Arafat at the time. So he told his uh, people to go to the son of Elijah Muhammad and tell him I invite him to come to my tent. I did. I came to his tent. Uh, Pakistanis always have big numbers in the Hajj. I came to his tent and when I walked up to him, he greeted me and asked me to sit near him. I sat near him. And then he began to speak to those who were in his tent. There were many. And uh, he said, Islam is a religion or an ideology for the reformation or the reform of the whole world. And <clears throat> that means Islam is a universal message. It's for all people. It's for all lands, all nations, all people. And, <clears throat> and uh, if we understand the Christianity, it is the same. Uh, it is a message to all people of the world. Amen. <clears throat> and, and the Jewish scripture, though it's uh, not propagated like Christians and Muslims propagate our religion, our faith, but Judaism also is a religion, a guidance from God to all people to all people, not just Jews, to all people. <clears throat> and it was Ju Judaism uh, that was uh, extended uh, to the world of the Europeans and others, to the whole world, um, by uh, Jewish leaders. Uh, and uh, as a result, there's a new, new, uh, mission and the New Testament. So we can't separate these groups. We speak of them as Abrahamic faiths. We all identify Adam as our first father in the human nature and <clears throat> we identify uh, Abraham called Ibrahim in our holy book, Abraham as the second father. 
second father. And these three faiths identify Father Abraham and uh, Father Adam. Actually, if we understand it, Father Adam extends as a creation, as a creation, he extends into Abraham on another plane and uh, uh, a second father comes out of him. Second father comes out of Adam, out of the essence of Adam comes a second father. And uh, uh, that's understandable if we understand Jesus in Christian teachings uh, being the second Adam, second Adam, a second Adam. <clears throat> we may differ somewhat with the number where, where it's placed, but Jesus is second in the ascension, in the ascension, or the as ascent of the human soul, as ascending upward to gain more, uh, more and all of its uh, life that God wants for it. So uh, it is life expanding, life rising up. As God says, and he has created us as a plant. A plant that's first a little seed like a dead thing under the soil or under the earth, and it comes out and it grows upward until it reaches its fullness or its maturity or its fullness as a life, completeness as a life. And God says in the parable of human life is the parable of a plant or that of a plant, <clears throat> meaning it starts from nothing. You can't hardly see it. It's in the bird in the earth. Our children, they start in, the, in the, our mother's bodies and the bodies of their mothers and <clears throat> they, we don't even know they're there until she tell us. And we, and we don't see it for nine months or until it reaches, reaches the stage when it wants to get out of that small confine and get into this big world of ours. Then we see it and it kind of turns over just before it comes out. It's sitting up and then it turns over and pushes its head down and comes right out. Puts his head down and comes right out. It says, unless you become as little babes. Huh? So that means we have to stop standing up so straight and so rigid. And we have to humble ourselves to the fullest extent before our maker, the Lord creator of everything. That's what religion is all about. It is about being complete in your recognition of God. If you recognize him, then be complete in that recognition. Don't put your small time thing before your duty to God. <clears throat> yes. Our religion says, in the, in the holy book, and our holy book, save yourselves and your families from fire. This fire is the fire of human passions. Script writers call poets, they have, since, since time began, I guess, for writers, they have always referred to human passions as fire. And our singers in our re in recent time, they sang songs of that fire. And they call love a flame, a strong passion, a strong appetite. <clears throat> we have to save ourselves from the fires. Now isn't it something how man can become scientific and know all about human nature? He knows the science of blood, bones, the heart, everything, the eyes, the science of sexuality, 
and a fine woman can make him nothing but a dog. <laughs> It doesn't have to be a fine woman in everybody's eyes, just a fine woman in his eyes. <laughs> Take him down to the dog. So that tells you that we need something bigger than man to save us. Especially in these times, when life is all about styling. We need something bigger in our lives, bigger than styling. Many of us don't know we're styling. Now, I used to wear an FOI suit. And believe me, when I put it on, I just felt different. I felt like, some, felt like my manhood woke up in me or something. You know? I felt like I had authority I didn't have before. And I walked, I was styling. <laughs> the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that my, I quote him now, my job is not so much to teach you religion, but to put you in a dress, a decent dress. See, God came to dress us up. Yes, that's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. And really, if you understand dress, when you are born from mama, and no clothes have been put on you. The doctor got you, or the, the, the nurse took you, or you delivered, and there's the baby naked. You say the baby is naked. Why do we wear clothing? We wear clothing because we are naked in our own minds. The horse come here dressed up for cold weather, whatever. But we don't. We don't come here dressed up. We come here naked in our minds. But now just look again. What are the clothing for? What is clothes for? Clothing is a protection. Clothing protects me from bad weather, clothing protects protect me from exposure, right. from exposing myself to everybody. So it's a private, it's a private thing. It, it, it helps me preserve my privacy, right. and I want to look good in my clothing. So you buy nice clothing, you should, you want to look good in your clothing. <clears throat> but what we have to understand is that the first clothing is the clothing of human life. Human life. Human life in its innocence and in its purity. Human life in its innocence and in its purity. No wonder the question was asked to Adam in the Genesis of the Bible. Who told you you were naked? And in our Quran is reference to the same situation where God says, and it was the shaitan, the shaitan, the devil, the first deceiver, and the worst of all deceivers. It was that one that seduced you and your mate to come out of the original clothing that God put you in. And says, and that was the clothing of righteousness. The clothing of righteousness. So what is that saying? Righteousness is not something a preacher has to give you, preaching the Bible. Righteousness is something that you were created with. You were created to be righteous. Right, righteous. Righteousness is your nature. It's an inherent quality that we are born with. The need and the drive to be correct Truthful, clean, decent, trustworthy, righteous, righteousness, sincere. Yes, that's all in the baby, in the nature of the baby, the baby's nature. When the baby is born, he's born, all, born already with all of that. 
There was a time in the history of criminology in the United States that I read about a student studying for this job I got. Uh, when criminology in the United States had taken a back, a backward move and was believing, just in the last long, believing that if they would sterilize, kill, kill the, the uh, nature to reproduce in, in the criminal, kill it by sterilizing them, that they would uh, save society from criminals that would be born from criminals. They soon established that that was incorrect, was false. And they said that criminology cannot come from a parent to a child. So it's learned. It's not inborn. It's not born with the baby. It's learned from the world. Learned in the world. Now, many of us, at, uh, perhaps, are not living to go to heaven, but you should be. And let me tell you something. You've already been in heaven. When you were in your mother, you were in heaven. And when you came before the world, tarnished you, or left its bad influences on you, you were in heaven. And whether you believe it or not, it took me all these years, but I'm in heaven. I was in heaven as a baby before the world influenced my thinking and my nature, and I'm in heaven again because I found the way back to heaven. And when you hear God says, and to him you must return. He only mean return to the person that he created. Return mean, like they say, I wish my child would come back. You're talking about one who left the church, or one who left the mosque, the temple, or whatever. And uh, it hurts you that they're gone, and they're leaving that lifestyle that you love them in, make you feel as though you lost them. And you say, I, I just pray God all the time that my child will come back to me. So you mean come back to that life that made him pleasant in your eyes and made you so that you didn't have to worry so much about his well-being. Yes, you want him to return to that. So we have to get rid of a lot of mystery. Mystery wastes time. This world is too fast, going too fast for us to be held up with mystery. Heaven, where is heaven? We know where heaven is when we understand what the meaning of heaven is. We think of the heavens as the sky. We look up, the sky. What does that mean? Heaven is more advanced than, than all that I see around here. Heaven is elevated. High, elevated high. Heaven is established high. High in the sense of, of meaning, substance, and also quality. Quality. So if you can accept this for me on this day in the city that I was born in, you all, some of you all want to take away my birthright. <laughs> oh, he man is from Chicago. He, 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 he lives in Chicago. That's his home. I, I, thought, I thought the place where a child was born is also his home. <laughs> and he should never lose that home. Right. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yes, I was born in Detroit. And Detroit is my home. And my father was redeemed in Detroit. 
<laughs> and became a new person, a new man, and did wonderful things and earned the title Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes. And I'm just continuing his good works. He said his main job is to put us in a dress. And he said a decent dress. Now that you have heard me comment on what, what is the real meaning of dress, he means put you in a decent lifestyle. Put you in an honorable, decent lifestyle. Now, some tricks of psychology begins uh, uh, concerning dress, might begin for us with, with the sisters wearing the dress that I see a few wearing right now, the headpiece and the dress, white long dress covering her whole body except her face. But for the brothers, it began with shine your shoes. Do not come to the temple with shoes that are not shine. And if we smell you while we're searching you, and you know we're going to be up close to you to search you, and you know you're not going to get into the meeting without being searched, if we smell you, we might send you home and tell you to take a bath. And put a crease in those pants. Respect yourself. And respect this house that you are coming to. Wear your decent clothes. Now, we thought that was all about black nationalism, Nation of Islam style. But no, when you read the Quran, God says, and wear your beautiful apparel at every place and time of prayer or masjid. That's what he says in the Quran. So that's also the requirement in Islam before Mr. Farad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad ask us to clean up ourselves and wear our beautiful dress when we come to prayer or when we come to the temple for service or for worship. What I'm saying to you is that we had a lot of help from Mr. Farad and from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We had a lot of help to get where we are today. A lot of help in more ways than you know. A lot of help to your Leader now, that you say is your leader, W.D. Muhammad, I call him my Imam too, Imam W.D. Muhammad. We had a lot of help to get him where he is, where he is now. And to bring him along a path, a path of progression or, and progress to come into the Quran, not as an import from Saudi Arabia or from Egypt or Pakistan or somewhere, but as a natural growth in the soil of the United States of America made suitable for that growth by W.D. Farrar and Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad put us in a new dress. There was a student at the time he was doing his dissertation for his PhD. His name is Asian, Asian Udum. He was African. Long time ago, this was before, before Malcolm got popular. And uh, he asked the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said, for my dissertation that I'm writing for PhD, can I interview some of the ministers and some of the regular followers? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave him permission. He interviewed me, he interviewed other ministers, he interviewed Minister James Shabazz. Last we call, last, before he passed, we called him Sheikh uh, James Shabazz. He interviewed him, he interviewed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he interviewed him. And he came to the conclusion after he studied the uh, following and Temple of Islam or Nation of Islam on the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he came to the conclusion that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's main work was the work of bringing African Americans into a new culture, a new culture. And another word for culture is dress, isn't it? Into a new culture, or into a new cultural dress. That was his conclusion. <clears throat> the 
Now, let me come back to dress. I spend a lot of time on dress. Because your dress has become so inflammable. You're, 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 you're on fire, most of you. Most of you that I see in the streets, you're just burning all the time. <laughs> on, just, just, just in flames, engulfed in flames. Because you're wearing volatile clothing. Yeah. Well, anyway, <clears throat> when you think of uh, dress, how dress influences personality, how it influences ego, ego. It can make a guy that had no enthusiasm, had no strength in him to stand up straight. He goes sad and droopy, yeah, dull. You put him in a uniform, and you don't have to give him a gun or a weapon. Just put him in a uniform and put some medals up here on his chest and stuff. And that guy perk up. Oh, fellas, come on, fella. When I was a little boy, about eight or nine years old, there was a corner near us, a busy corner. Uh, uh, and there was a guy who would be out there at a certain time every day. He had his own uniform. He, he even took some pop bottle tops, pop bottle caps, and he stuck them to his unit, took them to his, stuck them on his coat, so they looked like medals. And he'd be out there directing fella, <laughs> directing traffic, by me. <laughs> come on, come on, hey, get up. <laughs> he blow. <laughs> <laughs> he was somebody. Now. I'm ashamed to admit this, but it happened to me. <laughs> it was a long time before I went to the movies. In the Temple of Islam, you couldn't go to the movies. You weren't supposed to go to the movies. You could be actually put out of the Temple of Islam if, if, if they found out you had gone to the movies. So <clears throat> this time I, I went to this movie. It was John Wayne, you know, Duke, <laughs> big Duke. I saw this John Wayne movie, you know, and he had a special walk, didn't he? John Wayne had a special walk. He walked like he feared nothing, and nothing should mess with him. And he held his hand kind of like he was ready to draw at any time. Even though he was walking, one hand was swinging, wasn't getting too far away from the pistol. I watched that movie for about an hour and 15 uh, to a half, I guess, or more. I came out of there walking like Duke, walking like John Wayne. I'm moving like him. I'm, I'm in his spirit. He passed his spirit on to me. And I'm seeing myself in his clothes, in his hat, all right, his boots, with his gun. So there I am. I didn't take nothing of about, I think it was about two or three steps like that. And it registered on my mind what that movie had done to me. And I said, let me get out of this. <laughs> dress, dress can reach your soul inside of you and influence your soul to want to agree with the dress you are wearing. So now, can't you see the, see the problem with the, the man thinking he's naked? And then letting the Satan, the Shaitan, the Satan, suggest that he clothes himself? Yes. Now, passions. Strong appetites. Love is a passion. Hate is a passion. Any appetite in extreme that affects the heart it causes the heart to register the appetite. You give your heart to it. It's a passion. Life is relationships. Relationships. The first relationship 
is relationship you have with the, with the opposite sex. Right. And then from that relationship come children. Right. And the children then have a relationship both with parents and with each other. And we are told that we came from one parent of a male and female, or one soul of a male and female, saying that soul-wise, or as for the nature of the soul, male and female are one, are one. They have no difference. Soul life is the same for both males and females. The woman will cry if she's hurt. Some women won't cry when they're hurt. They're tough. They may be too, to too tough to survive. And the same for men. Some men will cry. Some men won't cry. They're too tough. And I say the same may be too tough to survive. So the nature of the soul has to be in male and female. Amen. If you lose your human emotionality, well. if you lose the ability to be hurt yeah. in your heart, well. you've lost your human wholeness. Yeah. That's it. That's it. God made us like this so we will register the hurt of each other. So we will do something about what's hurting each other. Yes. yes. Also, <clears throat> before leaving that, I must say that the growth of human life is seen in the connections you make with your intelligence, but more importantly, with your heart. You give your heart to a relative or friend. You give your heart to a stranger. The heart does not reject any human being or human life that needs it. It can be a stranger. You can't even speak that stranger's language. But you see a stranger on the road suffering, suffering. He's fallen on the, on the road and he's suffering. He's in pain. And you, he sp you speak to him and you can't understand his words. He doesn't even speak your language. You're desperate to find some help for him. Hmm? The heart is where we all should be. But we, 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 we reject our own heart. A suggestion is made to the mind, and we become selfish. And directed selfishly. So we pass by the hurt of our family member. Our hurting family members, we pass by the hurt of strangers. But God wants to awaken in us the true human spirit, the true human sensitivity. And that brings me to something else. God wants us to look at the world of nature and natural things that he created and let those things speak yes. from their pictures yes. to our intelligence and our hearts. Right. Yes. Sensitivities. When you cry, hurt, water come down. Huh? Little water come down. Tears come down. Sometimes they come down not because you're hurting, but because you're so happy. Yes. You can't hold back the water of sweetness. Yes. Huh? Yes, and sweet water will come down. Water. And we are told that all life had its beginning in water. So water is the beginning of our innocence, beginning of our natural, beautiful, sentiments, feelings, as human beings. But now, if you go to extremes in the water, 
and neglect to go to school and be educated or neglect to rise in knowledge or education, you will have no way where to live except in your water. Yes, sir. Except in water. So you'll be like a fish. With his head under water. And he can't bring his head out of the water. If he does, he'll die. Because his whole life has become that life of the water. And there are many of us like that in, in, in these churches and in these mosques and whatever, these spaces of worship for Muslims, Christians, and others. Many of us are like fish with our heads under water. We're afraid to take a chance on lifting our heads above the water. God didn't create us to be fish. All we have to do is lift our head above the water and we'll find that we are not limited to water freedom. Our freedom is to come on land and get the benefits of living on land. But we have to have the courage to trust that I won't die if I lift my head above the water. Some of us are in water up to the ankles, some up to the knees, some up to the chest, some up to the neck, some are submerged. Now, if you're going to be submerged, don't stay there. Your mission is on the land. If you're going to be submerged, then as soon as they duck you under for baptism, you got to come back up. And you know, we take full baths too. We don't call ourselves Baptists, but we take full baths too. Praise be to Allah. Thank God, that is. Praise God. <clears throat> yes. So our relationship, we have, to be, we have to be very regardful of relationships. Relationships are connections. Male and female connects. And when they connect, now they can produce. If they don't connect, they can't produce. You can't reproduce yourself unless you connect with your mate. The two of you all connect, now you can reproduce. That's a sign. I said, whatever's in nature, we should regard these things and see them as message givers. They're breathing out messages to us. Silently, that is. Silently sending off messages to our intelligence. So if you can't reproduce your life without having a female, a mate, and this has uh, no intent to put down homosexuals or lesbians. As far as I'm concerned, you have all the freedom you want. This don't bother me. <laughs> Yeah. Now, we want to reproduce. We want to reproduce the garden. God put us in a garden of paradise. And the picture of that garden called Eden in English, or in Christianity, or the Bible language, Judaism too. In fact, Adnan is Eden for Arabs. Same word. It's not in the Quran as such as such. But the Arabs, you study their culture, you find that they have a term called Adnan, and it's Eden, means Eden, and it's the garden of paradise. It comes from an ancestor that they have in their myth, in their myth, their stories of their uh, creation or beginning. They have this parent, and they believe that their life goes back to that parent where uh, life was good for human beings. So they do have kind of concept for Eden the same as uh, the people of the book, the Bible. Yes. So anyway, uh, the soul always wants peace. It can't have peace if the mind is in trouble. It can't have peace 
If the body is in trouble with the environment, life is threatened for one reason or another or by something, it can't have peace. It can't have peace if quality of life is going down. It wants quality life. It wants excellence. The drive and the human drive in the soul is for excellence. And if you, yeah, thank you. And if you don't, <laughs> if you don't do your best, you won't be happy. No. You know you have did it, you won't be happy. It doesn't have to register on your mind. Your home environment, you're rushing to see somebody, or you're rushing to go shop, whatever it is. But you left the, the, the toilet in a, the room in a mess. You left the kitchen in a mess. You left the bedroom in a mess. Only thing that was looking halfway straight was the front room because you don't want outsiders to know <laughs> what goes on in the bedroom. <laughs> and in the toilet, at, in the bathroom, and in the, in the kitchen, you know? Yeah. So you go to work and or go to your, see your friend or whatever, or go to shop, and you wonder how come you don't feel good. Well, any psychologist could tell you you're not feeling good because your soul won't accept what your mind imposes upon it. I don't think there's another people more unfulfilled in their souls than the African Americans of the United States of America. No matter how much encouragement we get to say, hey, we're doing fine. Colin Powell, great achievement for our common, common life, for our total life as a people. Great achievement for our life, Colin Powell. A man that white folks would support for the presidency of the United States, and I mean white folks in big numbers, was, would support, or will support, Colin Powell to be president of these United States. But then there's one that we're more closer to, Oprah. Look how successful that woman is. As a TV host, hosting her show. There's no white woman or anybody else that ever achieved what she have achieved as a TV host for her show, for, for any show. None of them have achieved it. She's the biggest thing in the history of such shows. Yes, she is. And she got plenty of money. <laughs> plenty of money. She gives gifts, big gifts of money to certain charities or certain causes that she feels she should support. Big money. But that is not enough right. to make us feel fulfilled right. in our souls. Right. No. And why do you think we can't feel that achievement, feel that we have achieved? Because people are connected that belong to the same history. We belong to the same history. No other people have our exact history. No other people experience life as slaves. Life as, life as second class citizens or as put down citizens put out of the benefits of the law and freedom 
that others had. Put out of that. No other people have had our history. Not that exact history. So we call each other soul brothers and we don't even know what way we're coming from. If I'm your soul brother, that means we came from the same situation or circumstances for our soul as a human person. This world didn't just cheat my body. This world doing slavery cheated my soul because God didn't intend for my man's soul to be born in slavery. God intended for the soul to be given to a world of freedom where he can compete on equal terms with others. And that was denied us. So we have a history that we share. And that history should be more important to us than the color of our skins. You know, if we really take that skin thing to its logical conclusion, if we mean that our blackness is really the blackness that we get from the sunshine, or the blackness that we got as a pigmentation of the skin from our parents, if that's what we think, think our blackness is, we can never go forward as a people with such idea. No, we can't. And it's, bad, it's worse for us. In fact, the only people will be worse off calling themselves black and thinking the skin was really the important thing would be if the white people would suddenly wake up in the morning and all of them start calling themselves black. Now we, we are not in that bad a shape, but I got a daughter that almost her skin is as white as many people's skin, as many white people's skin. Right. One of my daughters. Right. And I got children whose skin is black enough to be called black and you ain't telling no lie. <laughs> but we never raised them to, uh, in a way that would influence them to give important, more important to the skin color. When they say only skin deep, that's the, the, your, your blackness is no more than skin deep. In fact, it's not even skin deep. Because I had a little friend with me, a friend of my son, his name is Ramon. He's not Spanish. He's us. He's called, his name is Ramon, nice name. And uh, my son was grabbing him, they were playing, and uh, my son actually scratched him on his leg. So he showed me, he said, see, see when he scratched me, look, give me a scratch me, look. So I saw an opportunity to work on his uh, psyche. I said, wow. I said, you are white. He's black, really black skin. But when he got scratched, the scratch is white. I said, you're really white. I said, that's a little black on the top, but just scratch a little bit, man, you, you're white. <laughs> I remember a boy, again, I was a boy, maybe about 14 or 15, and I heard black, black men talking about how tough they were. Yes, sir. And they, they, back then, they were using knives a lot. Now they use guns a lot. They were using knives a lot. Say, yeah, man, that nigga was up in my face screaming and hollering at me. Man, I reached and popped out my blade. Man, I hit that nigga with my sharp blade, man, and you should have seen the white open up. <laughs> yeah, they used to talk like that, you know, the white of the flesh. If, if your knife is very sharp and you cut a black man real quick, his skin shows, his meat shows white beneath. Yeah, the white of the meat, it will show white until the blood rushes to it, and then you, the blood covers the white. So all of us are white beneath the skin, beneath the fine, thin layer of the skin, all of us are white. So what made some white and some black? The sun. The, the north, up there north, uh, north Europe, some, especially near the poles, they get very little sunshine, very little sunshine. 
they call the sun of the day the midnight sun. Call it midnight sun because it's dark. It'd be dark in the daytime. And they're just getting a little bit of light of the sun. So if you stay, if you stay for generations and generations, for thousands of years, in that kind of climate, I guarantee you the blackest man, blackest man you know, will eventually, not in one generation, but eventually over a long period of time, he would lose his blackness because your color comes from the sun. And if you don't have exposure to it, you won't get dark skinned. But it takes thousands of years, or maybe millions, to change color from one extreme to another. Uh, this is no more than science. This is just general science <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm sharing with you. Yes. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in one of his uh, lectures that he gave, he said that we get our color from the sun. This is, this is in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's language. It's there. It, uh, it's still there. In other words, we can prove this. We can get, get that speech or get the newspaper clipping article, whatever. We can show you where he said that. We, can, we get our color from the sun. <clears throat> so we shouldn't put all of this importance on the sun. I mean, on color, pardon me, on skin color. Don't put all that importance on skin color. I must admit that certainly skin color also is part of God's creation. And it sends a message too from the object that God created to our intelligence. So what message should we get from our black skin? In Christian or in Western culture, I shouldn't say Christian. Because Christian has to go back to the Bible and Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus in the Bible does not uphold these falsehoods. I'm a student of the Bible also. Very good one. Yes. I'm telling you, if you want to challenge me, I welcome you to challenge me. Because I'm a very good student of the Bible, as well as of the, our holy book, the Quran. <clears throat> Yes. So anyway, you couldn't support this if you went to the gospel of Jesus or the New Testament or Jesus Christ himself, his life. You couldn't support this idea. Couldn't support this kind of idea. In fact, you'd find just the reverse. You won't find a put down of black. You'll find a, lift, a lifting up of black, a raising it up as excellence. Um, now, but Somehow it comes into Christian culture, comes into cultural Western people, the European people, and the American people, that black also is degraded. Black is degraded. One time I was in the presence of, I have to watch the time here, I was in the presence of a white man, and he was talking to us, but through something else. And he said, suddenly it's dark in here. Well, we knew where we were. We knew he didn't see many of us. Not that often. And he couldn't let it be. He asked the woman that was with him. He said, what, what, what was the color, of the, the, color of, the sh the, of the dress you picked? Was it black? Black? He, he didn't say, was it black? Was it black? So I said, this life is really strange. I said, you love black dogs. You love black automobiles. You, you love black caviar when you go to a high class restaurant. I said, it's very strange. They became very silent and I could see hurt on their faces. That's all I said. I didn't say any more to them. So somebody, been tricking us, haven't they? Oh, I can't stand black. A friend of mine who was a Pakistani, he said, once I went to a restaurant in the South, he said, and I guess they thought I was colored, they told me I couldn't eat in that restaurant. He said, I, he said, I said to them, 
As I can, he said, I can see your cooks back there, behind there. He said, and they're cooking your food. He said, I'm sure they're putting their black hands in your food. <laughs> he said, why you accept to have black people cook your food and put their black hands in your food, but you can't serve me some food at your car? And he said he, he said he walked out. He just left. For the world is not what it appears to be. Truth is, is, is not easy, easy to identify in this world. This world is a world of deception, as is given in Scripture. It is a world of deception. It is a world designed by those class, a separate group. So that your psychology will be sickened, poisoned and sickened by their language. And your soul will be brought down and weakened. And you will think that you can't, you just don't have the nature. You're not made like them, so you can't succeed. You will buy consciously or subconsciously, unconsciously, you will buy the game and live in accord with the game. Put yourself down. This is a time when you have to stand up on your own feet, respect your own life, and thank yourself, thank you very much, and thank yourself equal in creation with everybody and anybody. God did not create inferiors and superiors. God created babies with all they need to become the president of the United States, the banker, the scientist in the lab, the politician, whatever. He gave them every, the soldier on the battlefield. He put everything in every baby, everything. And the circumstances that that child is put in is like the suitable ground for, for the life of any plant or any a seed of any plant. If you put it on stone, it can't have a chance. It can't grow in stone, not meant to grow in stone. If you put it in the desert, it has no ch chance unless you uh, turn the desert into an oasis, bring water there, it has no chance to live. But if you put it in, this, put it in a good environment, you're gonna see it grow and reach its potential reach its maturity that God created it for. It will become whole. Maybe his appetite will not be for the military, but that potential will be shown in something else. And it will achieve in something else as high as any person can achieve. There is no born inequality. There is only born equality. That's why God says, Chalaka wa fasa wa God says he created and then established equality. So, so God is saying that in terms of your original creation, all human beings are equal. All human beings are equal. Look how females, we thought females couldn't do certain things that males do, right? Now females, they, they got muscles like you and everything. They'll knock you out if you, if you get out of line. I mean, knock you out. <laughs> Not stun you, knock you out. Right. They're driving trucks, big trucks. The bigger they come, the more the female likes it. Why? Because she's been held back from her 